Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Willingham, and I'm with Beasley and Allen. And first off, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I have been informed that our marketing department will uh, submit your attendance today for your CLE hours, and we'll give you a copy of this presentation. So for most of you, you can put your uh, computers on mute and go about your business. Uh, for everybody else, I'd like to talk to you about screening and evaluating auto products cases and pre-lawsuit investigation. So uh, I'm going to go to a, a PowerPoint and hopefully there won't be any technical problems, but since I'm doing this with some assistance, uh, I, I will try not to screw this up. So let's uh, get started if we could. And as there we go. Uh, <clears throat> first off, when when looking at or investigating whether or not to uh, pursue a products case, I have a a list of of things that do's and don'ts. And my first list is the killer bees. Uh, the killer bees are. Uh, booze, belt use, uh, and bad facts or bankruptcy, and the uh, honeybees or bad injuries or known bad designs. So those are just big keys for, uh, for starting points. Um, one of the things that is, is critical in making a decision about taking on an automotive press worth in this case is you've got to screen from the very beginning. Uh, because you will be dealing uh, with the most obstructionist lawyers on the other side that are in the business. Um, and these are extremely difficult, complex cases that are made only worse uh, by the fact that, that automotive companies defend these cases uh, to the dirt. And um, the step one, um, you've got to get the vehicle. You've got to immediately locate and preserve the vehicle before it's disposed of for whatever reason. And uh, you can't have a car case without the car. Um, the number two factor to look at um, is whether or not there are alcohol and drugs involved. Now, as with every rule, uh, this is not an absolute. For example, uh, if you're, uh, representing a passenger, but if you're representing a driver, uh, um, you have got to be very careful. Obviously, you've got to get the tox records, either from the medical records um, or from the state and determine whether or not they can lay uh, a proper chain of custody. And as I said just a minute ago, whether or not uh, the impairment has any uh, relevance to the defect. and Obviously, you know where to look for uh, tox records. Uh, you go to the lab reports and look for uh, the ethanol levels. And at 164 milligrams per deciliter, that simply means a blood alcohol level of 0.16, which is, of course, twice the um, legal limit. Also, you can get these out of the uh, Department of Forensic Records um, and get the same information. Once you have determined there uh, is not going to be an issue about uh, alcohol or drugs, you have got to focus on was there belt use uh, by your potential client. And belt use today um, is almost a non-starter. There are certain exceptions to every rule, but if your client's not belted, uh, that is again one of one of the killer bees. Um, there are times when belt use should not be relevant. Um, rollover, that's arguable where, you're, where your sole theory is vehicle stability. You still should be able to utilize the Alabama statute on point that says you cannot introduce lack of belt use. Um, also, it should not be relevant uh, in a case involving a tire 
uh, tread separation or in a case involving a post-collision fuel fed fire. That said, uh, I would caution anyone to pursue a case where there is clear evidence of no belt use. Um, uh, there have been many times over the course of, of my 35 years of doing this where you have an accident report where the police officer says uh, plaintiff wasn't belted or the, excuse me, the passenger or the driver or whoever is not wearing their seatbelt. Um, many times uh, they just uh, base this decision on, quote, I'm um, Barney Fife and I said he's not belted because he was ejected from the vehicle and therefore he's not belted. This particular case, I handled this case years ago and unfortunately a young man was killed. You can see the uh, belt wound across his chest uh, and he was ejected from the vehicle, but yet the police officer put in his report that he was not wearing his seatbelt. Uh, that case went on to be resolved uh, very favorably for the family, but also is just proof that you can't just glance at the uh, accident report and make your decision based on that. Um, you've got to have somebody, uh, either a knowledgeable investigator uh, to help you or you yourself uh, to look for physical evidence of seatbelt use. Now, this one is obvious, it's a broken belt. Uh, where the belt actually tore in a collision. Um, ironically, it was the same case that I just showed you the physical evidence and uh, Deputy Dan was unable to make the logical connection that he was wearing his belt and it simply tore. Um, you can look for load marks on various components of the seat belt like this is what's called a D-ring which is mounted on the side pillar of a car and those marks, those striations are where the belt webbing actually melts into the plastic D-ring and causes these telltale signs of, of belt use. Um, one other thing to, to caution you, another killer bee, are bad accident facts. Um, juries uh, are reluctant to reward folks or to issue awards where you have bad accident causation facts and manufacturers hone in on this, even where the bad fact and accident causation has nothing to do with your client's injury. You still have to look at that. You know, obviously this is a, an exaggeration, but where your client drives off a cliff uh, or where an accident is so severe that no safety feature or any um, component of an automobile could have prevented the injury. So you've got to look out for bad accident facts. Obviously the worst is speeding. Um, if you have a crash that occurs uh, at very, very high uh, rates of speed, closing speeds of vehicles, those again are things that you've got to look at on the front end before you spend a bunch of money uh, hiring experts, um, and then uh, how you get this information, obviously, uh, to decide whether or not you've got uh, booze, bad, bad facts, or no belts, um, you get this information. Number one, the most important thing to do is secure the vehicle. Once you've got the vehicle, you obviously have to get the accident report, police photographs, or 911 tapes. You then need to have an investigator interview uh, the police officer or any eyewitnesses or the fire department or EMTs uh, to get their factual information. As I talked about earlier, you need to get the tox reports, uh, your initial medical records. Uh, and one thing that folks sometimes don't do is get tow truck operator statements or tow truck reports. And how that can be important is they, when they tow vehicles from the scene, sometimes they make changes, uh, especially with the seat belt. Sometimes they will take a seat belt uh, and tie off a door with it 
uh, and alter evidence. So you need to pin them down to make sure that's not going to be a problem for you. Um, you also need to get, um, you can get this information from the state of Alabama. You need to get driver's license histories for all the drivers. Uh, SR 13 forms um, are kept by the Department of Public Safety, which provides you with insurance information. You then need to make sure you have all of the uh, sales and service records for the vehicle that you can get from Carfax by simply plugging in the VIN number. Uh, you'll need to get weather reports for the time of the accident. You can get those from, I've listed them on the uh, out on the printout, but you get that from the National Weather Center. You then need to, um, I would suggest get information from NHTSA via the safercore.gov uh, website where you can plug your VIN number in uh, to see whether or not there have been recalls on your vehicle. You can also submit a, a FOIA request to the NHTSA to find out specifics about their investigations of a vehicle that may or may not have led to a recall. Uh, if there's a death, obviously you need the coroner's report or an autopsy. And uh, then you need to gather all of this information before you start plunking down a heck of a lot of money with experts. And believe it or not, these guys, uh, they love to bill more than defense lawyers. Uh, you're gonna have to start off with an accident reconstructionist to reconstruct your crash. Then you have to hire a um, vehicle design expert who will validate the defect uh, and also provide you with alternative designs. You've got to have a biomedic, biomechanical engineer or a bio, uh, biomechanic to tie in the defect to the injury. And then you have to have, a, if it's a traumatic injury case, a paraplegic, quadriplegic, or brain injury, you've got to have a life care planner, and then you have to have an economist. Um, the biggest screener um, before you actually spend a lot of time and a lot of money is you must have a bad injury. And, and I can't tell you how many times I have folks ask me what a bad injury is. Um, and without um, being uh, insensitive, I, I usually ask, did your client walk in to your office and tell you about his case? If the answer to that is yes, then you don't have a case. Um, they uh, and I often hear, well, my client has a hundred, or excuse me, a million dollars in medical bills. And of course, our Supreme Court says that uh, um, insurance uh, bills that have been paid by insurance can be shown to a jury. So a million dollar hospital bill will probably have been paid by either Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Medicare or Medicaid and will be pennies on the dollar. So you can't, it, these cases cannot be brought simply by high medical bills. You have got to have a horrific injury. Really, uh, death is the least uh, significant injury uh, that you can have before pursuing one of these cases. So what is a, what is a bad injury? Well, it's quadriplegia, paraplegia, other types of spinal cord injuries that lead to permanent paralysis, a uh, traumatic brain injury where, uh, and by traumatic brain injury, I mean a real traumatic brain injury, not one that is uh, just noted a couple of times in the medical records, you've got to have a disabling uh, traumatic brain injury, burn injuries uh, of all types, but they must again be severe, uh, generally requiring uh, third degree burns and uh, loss of a limb. Um, so I'm going to talk a little more in detail when we get into the weeds, but uh, there are certain areas of common design auto defect cases. So I kind of categorize them into certain areas. So we'll, we'll start with accident causation defects. Um, electronic stability control and side curtain airbags that 
quite frankly, have resulted in vehicles because of plaintiff lawyers pursuing these types of cases against manufacturers have pretty much eliminated accident causation defects. Now, we still see them from time to time, but uh, rollover propensity. My, my law partner, Chris Glover, is, is working on, uh, without a doubt, the biggest uh, rollover case I've ever seen involving a 15-passenger van. Unfortunately, seven uh, women died in a rollover here in Georgia uh, of a Chrysler 15-passenger van, and these things are uh, absolutely rollover bombs. Uh, they have no stability, and um, they are very rollover prone. Um, those types of rollover cases include historically the Bronco II, uh, the Ford Explorer, um, and a lot of SUVs manufactured it at the turn of the century, and by that I mean 2000. Um, pretty much, as I said earlier, this defect has been eliminated by electronic stability control, which is a safety device that halts brakes each of the wheels uh, when, when they are reaching their limits in a side slide to effectually straighten out the vehicle and to prevent uh, rollover. Uh, other accident causation defects obviously are tread separations in tire cases where you're uh, tire tread comes off of the tire and leads to a loss of control of the vehicle. And in those instances, a tread separation will in fact override electronic stability control. Also, um, there are uh, throttle stick or uh, sudden acceleration cases where a crash is caused uh, by uh, a defect with the uh, acceleration system uh, of a vehicle. Uh, one of these um, dealt with Toyota uh, a few years ago, uh, Graham Esdale, Ben Baker, and uh, Jerry Beasley uh, all tried a case uh, dealing with software defects in Toyota vehicles that led to runaway crashes. And so unfortunately, those are still out there today, those types of defects. You also have uh, what are called part to reverse cases where someone has put their vehicle into park and for whatever reason, the transmission slips and backs and can uh, run over uh, people. Um, next, uh, uh, you know, there are enhanced injury causing defects or what are otherwise known as crashworthy, crash, excuse me, crashworthiness defects. And these involve either frontal impacts, rear impacts, side impacts, or rollover with roof crush. And obviously in your frontal impacts, you can have airbags either non-deploying, late deploying, or exploding like in the Takata cases. And I'll talk to you about that in just a second. You can have overly aggressive airbags where an airbag deploys in a frontal crash in an overly aggressive uh, manner and can cause injury. You have seat belt designs uh, that can be defective for a variety of reasons. Uh, seat belt unlatching, uh, seat belt spool outs, which have uh, become more frequent uh, these days because of what's called a load limiter. Uh, many manufacturers uh, place what's called a load limiter in their retractor for the uh, stated purpose of trying to lower chest Gs or potential chest injuries and frontal impacts. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, in connection with a load limiter, that will actually cause the belt to completely spool out and you've got an unrestrained passenger who's wearing their seatbelt. Um, and those are disastrous. Um, you have lap belt only claims. Um, unfortunately, there are still vehicles in the mid 2000s that have lap belts only in center seating positions, and those can cause horrific uh, lower spinal cord injuries uh, caused when occupants will jackknife over the seat belt. 
uh, rare uh, seatbelt defects dealing with door mounted seatbelt retractors. Uh, those are pretty much non existent for vehicles made after 2005. We are still seeing um, what's called forgotten uh, children occupant cases where seatbelt issues are actually seatbelt fit issues are actually causing injuries to children. And the reason for this is, is that uh, seat belts are only designed to fit and work for um, the fifth percentile female, which is um, 95 pounds up to a 95th percentile male, which is 220 pounds. So if you're bigger than 220, like me, or smaller than 95 pounds, like uh, Mary Leah pre-pregnancy, your seat belt may not work. Uh, and we see this as, as especially problematic for small children who have outgrown uh, their booster seats and uh, are then placed into an adult seat belt that does not fit them properly because it wasn't designed to. And this can lead to um, high neck injuries. It can also lead to shoulder slip because their little shoulders are too small to fit into the belts and can cause them to jackknife over the seat belt, uh, just as if they had no upper body restraint. Other defects, um, lack of a seat belt pretensioner. We're currently involved in a case now uh, against uh, Range Rover where they had a fully functional seat belt pretensioner in the driver's seat that was to activate in a frontal impact, but yet they chose not to have it, even though uh, it was technologically equipped to deploy in a rear impact, they simply chose not to do that. And uh, our client was horribly injured in a rear impact uh, and is paralyzed because of that decision. And in rear impacts, that um, one of the uh, predominant defects are seat backs collapses. And uh, that's where you have a, a rear impact and the front seat back uh, collapses and either the front seat passenger is injured uh, or in many cases we've seen children uh, that were killed when their parents uh, were thrown back into the rear, uh, rear occupant compartment because their seat back no longer restrained them. Um, we have cases in rear impacts where you just have a poor design and because of that design, um, the rear seat occupants get hurt. Um, Chris Glover, my partner is currently working on a, a case against Toyota where there was a uh, relatively survivable low speed crash, but the car deformed so poorly that a child who was belted and properly positioned in the left rear outboard seating position was crushed in between the rear intrusion and uh, the front, the driver front seat back. So um, these are horrible, horrible things when they happen. Um, side impacts, uh, we have had cases where uh, Seat belt buckles will release in a side impact, causing the occupant to be unrestrained. Uh, lack of a side curtain airbag that would be deployable in a side impact, either uh, because the manufacturer did not include a side curtain airbag or because it malfunctioned. Um, also, we have seen side impacts where there was no side door guard beam. Uh, in the side doors, which unbelievably uh, is not required by any federal regulation. Uh, also, we have had uh, defective door latch cases where in side impacts, uh, the door latch will uh, become disengaged and folks can get either partially or fully ejected uh, because of a defective door latch. Um, rollover cases primarily still involve roof crush. Um, where you have a roof that simply crushes down in 
a, a rollover crash and causes dra uh, absolutely horrible injuries uh, to folks, generally uh, quadriplegia or paraplegia uh, because they are hit striking down in a rollover crash. Also in rollovers, manufacturers do not test uh, their vehicles nor their seat belts to determine how they work in a rollover crash. So the federal regulations only require them to uh, test the seat belts in frontal crashes. There is no requirement for performance in a rollover, as unbelievable as that is. So many seat belt systems in rollovers will simply not latch, or excuse me, not lock and folks can get up into uh, out of position and f be further hurt by an intruding roof. Uh, you also have seat belts that come unlatched during rollover crashes, either because of uh, occupant contact or what's called inertial release. Uh, and also just like with a side impact, there are vehicles still out there that don't have uh, rollover activated side curtain airbags or what's called or called a safety canopy. And, and even if they do, we have seen many times where there was an improper calibration of the RCM or what's called the restraints control module or black box, where the black box does not pick up that the vehicle is going to be in a rollover crash and even though it is equipped with these safety devices, they don't deploy. So uh, here are some examples of some rollover prone vehicles that I just talked about. Your, your 15 passenger vans, uh, your SUVs, um, tread separations, just uh, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, these appear to be obvious, but what is absolutely critical is if you have a tread separation case is that you have an investigator um, who will go out and find scalp of the tire. And when I say scalp, I mean the uh, tread that detreads during the crash. It is absolutely pivotal that they spend the time at the scene to pick up um, tread pieces so that you can match them up uh, because invariably the defense will come in and say, well, your tire tread separated because uh, you didn't properly inflate your tire or that you ran over some object in the road. And since we don't have pieces of the tread to prove otherwise, uh, we simply know that to be the case. So. I cannot stress enough that it's not just critical to pin down, preserve, and locate the vehicle. If you expect that there was a tread separation involved, you have got to put in um, the effort to go back and um, get the tread pieces. I can't tell you how many times uh, that has proven uh, effective in our cases and how it hurts when you don't have it. Um, this is an outmoded defect as um, vehicles after, I believe it's 2015, are required to have electronic stability control. And what electronic stability control is, for those that don't know, uh, the RCM uh, or the black box of the vehicle also controls uh, pulse braking to each of the wheels so that if you are in a potential rollover electronic stability control works by pulse braking each of the wheels and of course the tires to cause the vehicle to straighten up and to prevent it from going in to a side slide which will then lead to a rollover. So um, I think I said this earlier that uh, electronic stability control and side curtain airbags have pretty much eliminated uh, rollover uh, crash deaths, other than of course with roof crush, uh, because number one, the vehicles aren't rolling over to begin with, and number two, when they do, you have, uh, if it works properly, uh, a rollover activated side curtain airbag that provides occupants with head protection in the roll, assuming that the roof doesn't collapse. 
So this is a tremendous safety feature uh, and it's um, uh, pretty much eliminated rollovers. Uh, throttle sticks we talked about earlier, trans transmission slip or park to reverse cases we talked about earlier as well. Now, surprisingly, despite all of the safety advents that we are seeing in vehicles, vehicle deaths are still remaining constant. Um, they are still uh, fluctuating around 50,000 deaths per year on the, our United States highways. And uh, that is directly in the face of the addition to all of, of the safety features. And why is this still occurring? Well, it's still occurring uh, because automotive manufacturers are still having problems with their safety features functioning properly where they do have them in cars and with the overabundance of cell phone use. So there have been all kinds of, of initiations and passive uh, safety devices that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. But we're also seeing that the uh, recalls for defects uh, have risen sharply since 2000. And the reason for this is, is the reporting requirements from the TRED Act. Uh, in addition to us as lawyers bringing automotive manufacturers uh, to the table and making them accountable for their defects, they are now required by the TRED Act, which was a direct result of the Ford Explorer Firestone disaster, uh, to have better reporting to the NHTSA. Uh, the NHTSA with its uh, 50 investigators who uh, in between coffee breaks and donut breaks um, may in fact pay attention to this information and uh, this will lead to recalls and uh, but not always uh, like the Takata disaster that I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute but after the Ford Firestone disaster uh, the TRED Act requires manufacturers to report defects to the NHTSA who may or may not do something about it. And when they do finally do something about it, uh, recalls are initiated. So we, we are seeing a jump in recalls from 2000 up until 2017 and even up until today. Um, going back to the worst um, automotive defect of all time is the Takata airbag. That has led to now um, over 150 million. I've got 100 million, so um, I, I put this PowerPoint together a little while ago, but it's now up to 150 million cars with Takata airbags that have been recalled. And Takata, uh, like every uh, mass murderer, has uh, sought protection and got protection in bankruptcy. So Takata no longer exists. And going back to one of my killer bees, bankruptcy uh, has, been, has been used by Ford, or excuse me, by Chrysler, uh, GM, and Takata. And now Honda, uh, who had the most Takata airbags in their vehicle, has manipulated the bankruptcy system to allow them to pull into bankruptcy uh, a Takata airbag defect where Honda is sued for providing a Takata airbag, they can now pull you into the bankruptcy process despite the fact that Honda uh, is financially one of the most well-off automotive manufacturers in the world. So they get the benefit of putting this defective junk in their cars and then turn around and get protection from the bankruptcy courts. And uh, this is done under the um, a beautiful synonym of a channeling agreement. And it's, isn't that a wonderful word, channeling agreement? They can channel you uh, into bankruptcy because they chose to put a piece of junk airbag in your car. And it is absolutely obscene that they are able to get away with this. So 
if you have a Takata airbag that causes an injury to your client, the only recourse you have is against the OEM or the original automobile manufacturer, except if your client is unfortunate enough to have a Honda vehicle, uh, then you get pulled into the bankruptcy and then you get pulled into a scheduled injury where they pay you pennies on the dollar uh, and it's, it's awful. So who are the automobile manufacturers that have utilized Takata airbags? Uh, Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors here in the United States. The Japanese are Honda, Toyota, Nissan, Subaru, um, Koreans, Kia, Hyundai, and even your European manufacturers, BMW, Mercedes, Ferrari, and Porsche use Takata airbags in some of their vehicles. The only manufacturer who did not uh, was Volvo. Um, but pretty much every car manufacturer in the world has sold a car with a Takata airbag. Prior to uh, this disaster, they were the number one supplier of airbags for the entire automotive manufacturer uh, community. Uh, pretty much two thirds of every vehicle sold uh, prior to 2015 had a Takata airbag in. And um, sorry, I can't read this, but attached in your materials is a uh, not a current list, but a uh, previous list um, of all of the United States bound vehicles that had Takata airbags in them. And, and again, that was not a, an exhaustive list. But what is the Takata defect? Um, when I talk about this, it almost borders on um, the unbelievable. But for years and years, automobile manufacturers who purchased airbags from their suppliers always used a chemical called sodium azide, which is solid rocket fuel uh, as a propellant. And that had been approved uh, by the NHTSA for decades. It is an extremely stable um, chemical under all environmental conditions. And it had been used uh, by every airbag uh, component part manufacturer literally for decades. And there was never, ever any incident of a recorded explosion before the Takata uh, disaster of the 2000s. Um, it is a very expensive chemical compared to what Takata chose to use. And in the late 1990s, Takata, in its infinite wisdom, decided to use ammonium nitrate, uh, which many of you will know as fertilizer, as its new propellant, despite knowing of its volatility. And it's, um, it's not funny to point out, it's really rather sickening, that the, uh, I asked one Takata engineer uh, if Timothy McVeigh was um, their uh, propellant design engineer, uh, which obviously calls the uh, defense lawyer a little uh, stomach acid. But of course, Timothy McVeigh used ammonium nitrate to blow up the Murrah building. Um, but uh, ammonium nitrate is extremely volatile and dangerous because it is subject to de degradation in, in months, uh, especially in high heat and humid conditions. Um, and the American engineers uh, with Takata, which is ironic, I, I'm going to talk about uh, some documents that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, but during the criminal proceedings, when the United States government basically got a bunch of money for the government and a bunch of money for the manufacturers and pennies for victims, there were a series of memos that had been sent between U.S. Takata engineers that basically said, if somebody finds out about this, we're all going to jail. Ha, ha, ha. And what this was, was that during some of their tests, 
um, they experienced these explosions um, where the airbag canisters exploded and shrapnel went everywhere. And some of these engineers, um, despite some lawyers' efforts, were never criminally prosecuted. Uh, I was at, uh, among a bunch of other lawyers, was at the, uh, were, were appeared at the criminal proceedings where Takata basically bought off uh, jail sentences by paying a uh, billion dollars to the government and a billion dollars to the uh, manufacturers to pay for the costs of the recalls that they had to initiate. And um, five, I think it was 900 million went to a victim's compensation fund. And um, all of this uh, was just an absolute abuse of victims. And um, we appeared at the hearings. Uh, we told the judge who was approving the criminal settlement that there were documents that we would love to give to the government if somebody would subpoena us. And as you might guess, they said, thank you very much. We'll take the money and you and your clients go home. Uh, and it's, it's one of the worst things I've ever seen as a lawyer, uh, the complicity of our government in this. Um, but going back to what the defect is and, and why did Takata choose it, I, I, I bet nobody is gonna be surprised when I tell you money. Uh, the cost of a, ammonium nitrate is 90% less than sodium azide. And Takata only passed along a uh, less than 50% reduction in cost to the manufacturers who guess what? How much do you think they passed on to the customers? Uh, if you guess zero, you would be absolutely right. So the only people who made money on the cost reduction of utilizing this bomb as an airbag uh, was Takata and the uh, automotive manufacturers who sold the airbags. Um, and I think I, I this was an admission by one of the uh, Takata plant managers that happened in a, in a um, deposition where he admitted to me that they had done no test. And this was before uh, we were made privy to the emails where they knew uh, that the airbags were exploding. But he admitted um, that there was no evidence or never any test results that, that substantiated that Takata had overcome the phase stability problem. And what that means is they did nothing to prove that they could stabilize ammonium nitrate to be used in this capacity. And the government never required them to. So, um, and this is gonna be too difficult for y'all to see. So I'll big picture you. How this is, is a problem is that an airbag inflator is filled with this propellant and they look just like Tic Tacs. So you have a steel, either aluminum or steel canister that is filled with these propellants. And when the sensor uh, detects a crash, it sends an electrical signal to the inflator causing when working properly, the propellant to ignite and to create this nitrogen gas that inflates the airbag in less than 30 milliseconds and provides um, the deceleration um, cushion when it works properly. When it doesn't work properly uh, in the Takata fiasco, each of these propellants ignites separately. So instead of a uniform um, ignition that creates this gas, you have a chain reaction explosion. And this, I'm going to show you a, a film that this came from the Takata test that they did not produce to the government uh, initially. And this is what happens uh, when the inflator doesn't work properly. It explodes and sends shrapnel into the occupant, occupant compartment. And if you're big and tall, it hits you in the chest and stomach and you get some pretty nasty wounds. If you're tiny, it will uh, 
cut your throat. Uh, we've had a case where a 16 year old girl was killed in a parking lot where her airbag exploded and cut her carotid artery. And um, um, she died. Um, this case is a case called Brandy Owens. She had a, this, this happened in the Atlanta area. It's a case I handled for Brandy. And because of Brandy and her courage um, in pursuing the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the Takata uh, recall went from a few uh, Honda vehicles to a worldwide recall of every Takata airbag that was made utilizing a, a ammonium nitrate. But what happened in Brandy's case, she was in a very, very minor impact on Georgia 400 where she tapped a car in front of her and her airbag shouldn't have gone off to begin with, but it blew off the steering wheel, sent metal all throughout the occupant compartment. Uh, and this object here is what's called the bat wing and the bat wing uh, blew through her steering wheel, a piece of uh, metal about six inches in diameter uh, that looks just like this. Um, as you can see, it's shaped like a bat wing and uh, blew through her uh, orbital bone and socket and into her optic nerve, tore her eyeball and blinded her. Uh, a case that uh, we're currently involved with against Toyota also had a Takata airbag where the airbag exploded outwards and provided superior protection for the windshield wipers, but uh, unfortunately none for the occupant. So the airbag exploded in such an aggressive manner uh, that it, it exploded outwards, uh, but didn't protect the occupant in the compartment. And there's the size, it's almost five inches in diameter of the hole where the shrapnel came out and our client was horribly injured. We also have had a case um, involving, we're currently litigating, unfortunately, uh, in the bankruptcy court, fighting this channeling agreement for a young girl who was horribly injured uh, when her airbag uh, exploded. And um, uh, these are just other examples. Um, and my uh, time folks are looking at me like, uh, not only are we tired of you talking, Tom, but you're running out of time. So I apologize. I'm going to have to run through these next few slides, but you can can also look through your medical records, uh, although most of these injuries are going to be obvious. In some cases, doctors will uh, note that they find uh, pieces of metal uh, in your client's bodies. Um, this again is another example of where a bat wing blew through the uh, steering wheel hub. And thankfully for this young lady, she only had a cosmetic injury. If, if the wound had been a little lower, she would have been killed. We've had cases where bullet-like projectiles have come out and actually hit our clients in the chest like a bullet. Um, and um, um, that's it for Takata. Um, those will be uh, self-evident for the most part, but I'd like to talk to you just real quick about self-driving cars and how um, those defects uh, can cause injury. One of the things that um, manufacturers have done is they have repeatedly petitioned the NHTSA to give them immunity to release these self-driving cars onto the American public and to use us as guinea pigs without uh, thoroughly testing those systems, which have to be tested and validated, not only in crash labs or um, in crash tests, but out there on our American highways, because these things are not working. Uh, they are not working correctly, and they certainly aren't working 100% uh, of the time. So every year we have been faced with a battle of industry lobbyists 
petitioning the NHTSA and petitioning Congress for immunity to immunize them for uh, using us as guinea pigs. And some of the problems uh, that can happen even with a properly functioning system is that it can be hacked. Um, and this is an example of a, of a Jeep Cherokee that was hacked by some hackers. It's not fun to have your two ton SUV. And since we're kind of pressed for time, um, can you imagine uh, in the hands of a hacker, uh, these little computer geeks um, who already hack our systems and cause us uh, all kinds of problems, can you imagine the damage they could do sitting out on 285 hacking vehicles and causing crashes and the manufacturers still have not fixed this problem. Now, the good news is when it works properly, uh, 10 to 15 years down the road, when all vehicles on the road have this technology and they uh, fix these systems, then uh, this is going to eliminate not only lawyer jobs, but uh, insurance adjuster jobs and auto repair shop jobs, but but that day is, is very far away, and certainly um, the American public does not deserve to be treated as guinea pigs while they perfect uh, this system. Uh, this was going to be a Mercedes video that, that we're running out of time for me to show you, but essentially Mercedes has come in and said, well, you couldn't wreck this car if you tried. And uh, in the future, that may very well be true, but it's not, not now. Uh, autonomous technology, as I said, is not here. Um, cars can crash, um, even in a Volvo. And this, um, now this is worth watching. This is a presentation that Volvo did um, to a worldwide audience. They invited the worldwide press to show, look, even if you're not paying attention, our Brake assist will override your, your inattentiveness and stop your vehicle uh, from rear ending a trailer. So, in front of the worldwide press, this happened. That is whoops in Swedish. Um, if you could hear him, that was the Volvo engineer uh, cussing in Swedish. Uh, there have been um, literally thousands and thousands of documented incidents showing where self-driving cars are not working because of conditions um, that the uh, designers didn't anticipate that happen out in the real world that don't happen in the crash test lab, like uh, construction zones or potholes or hills. But here's an example of an Uber, uh, and you gotta look kind of carefully, just blowing through a red light. Uh, it, it'll be to the right of the screen. Everybody else stops, except for the Uber right here that's blowing through the red light. Um, there have been documented deaths involving that same Uber vehicle where uh, pedestrians have been hit uh, that had detection, pedestrian detection systems in a fully autonomous vehicle uh, where folks were killed. Um, 
they had a um, a rollover where a, a driverless car rolled over. Um, Tesla, um, this is kind of a, a severe uh, video, but this is from the interior of a Tesla involved in a crash in China where the brake override system did not work and the um, um, driver was killed. Oop, we got to go back. And the driver's driving in the far outside lane. The system does not pick up a parked tractor trailer and, or excuse me, dump truck and the uh, driver was killed. Um, Again, the technology is not there. This one, uh, I'd like to tell y'all that uh, no car salesman was injured during the making of this film, so you don't have to worry about this. But uh, here, a Volvo dealership owner was showing the press how well this pedestrian avoidance system works. Uh, ouch. Again, uh, no car salesmen were hurt during the making of that video. Uh, there have been a, uh, there's been a pedestrian death in Tempe, Arizona, involving uh, a uh, Tesla. Um, there have been uh, Uber crashes repeatedly in Arizona where they were utilizing uh, a fully autonomous vehicle where someone was killed. Um, the defect for these systems are multiple. Um, some of them are where you use too few sensors or your sensors were improperly designed or they were improperly calibrated or the system was designed where there was an improper handoff. Uh, and what that means when, is when you're switching from car fully automation to human, uh, the system sometimes malfunctions. Um, some of the problems that the designers of these systems have encountered that they did not unbelievably anticipate during the design process would be not detecting constructed construction zones or situations to where uh, the driver had to intervene with a fully automated system too frequently, that there was too much traffic or too many occupants. Uh, there was difficulty in, um, um, picking up or dropping off drivers uh, from fully automation and dealing with difficult problems uh, like with geography, like hills, where the system does not pick up a hill. Um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, 15 to 20 years from now, for all you young lawyers, um, y'all may have to look for something else to do, but I anticipate it will take at least that long to perfect the system because it's not going to work until they eliminate all of the bugs and not only eliminate the bugs but to also have all of the vehicles you must you can't have some vehicles with it and some without for these systems to work appropriately um again we talked about most of these a little while ago your traditional uh, auto product liability cases I'm not going to rehash all of that. Uh, we talked about rollovers, rear impacts, tire defects. Um, this video is kind of funny because when, when you have a tire defect case, um, every time uh, the tire manufacturer will come in and defend your case, uh, getting on the driver, whether it be your client or someone else, that that when a tread separates, it's simply an easy thing to avoid. All you have to do is let off the gas, hold the wheel, and you'll come to a controlled stop. Well, one of their uh, famous defense engineers, a guy named Don Tandy, uh, accidentally left this video um, in his uh, production in a case where <laughs> he was running a bunch of tests to show folks how easy it is to 
control your car when the tread uh, separates. And if his vehicle had not been equipped with outriggers, he would have rolled it. So uh, there's some customers in here. So. Uh, call 911. Uh, <laughs> that is a great video to, to use um, where they come in and, and tell you how easy it is to control your vehicle in the event of a tread separation. One thing I barely touched on uh, are door latch cases uh, where your door uh, can come off, especially in a rollover crash, and it reduces the roof strength or leads to partial or full ejection. Seatbelt defects we've already talked about. Um, and I talked to you about ways that you can spot those both with physical evidence to the uh, on the belt itself and to the passenger. Uh, fuel system defects uh, or what we refer to as post-collision fuel fed fires where there has been a total failure of the tank and a rear impact. The most notorious of this, uh, of course, is the Ford Pinto, but uh, more currently, um, we've handled cases against uh, Jeep where they have continued to mount the fuel tank in the crush zone between the rear bumper and the rear axle. Um, uh, a newer defect that uh, won't last for long because of the way it malfunctions is a couple of manufacturers uh, have have thought to prevent uh, submarining where folks go up under the lap belt by adding this anti-submarining device that literally did this to uh, 150 pounds worth of weight. Uh, it explodes the same way as an airbag, but in this particular instance, unfortunately, we had a, a lady paralyzed because of her back injury uh, when her seat airbag, or excuse me, her seat cushioning device exploded and fractured her spine. Um, frontal airbag defects, in addition to the shrapnel, we've had them where they don't deploy. Same thing with side impact airbags. Seat back defects, things to look for is where the seat back uh, collapses in a rear impact crash. And then uh, folks are screaming at me now. Uh, I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards where the music is starting to play. There are a multitude of, of heavy, heavy truck defects. My law partner, Ben Baker, has had a couple of huge verdicts against truck manufacturers for failing to equip their cabs with rear impact guards. Um, roof crush, heavy trucks don't comply uh, with any roof crust standard. Um, so you get the same result. Heavy truck fires where they mount their fuel tanks on the side of vehicles and they are ruptured in side impacts, either injuring the cab operator or uh, occupants of vehicles involved in the crashes. Um, also battery placements where they place batteries right next to the fuel source, and that results uh, in a fire. Um, sorry for uh, uh, the length of time. Uh, I guess many of you have already left. If you're still here uh, and have any questions, um, I'd, I'd love to, to try to see if I can answer them. Um, if I can get my glasses on. Yeah, uh, here's a, a question um, from Yolandra. Um, yeah, and any, and this may have been earlier, the types of experts that you have to hire are going to be an accident reconstructionist who reconstructs the crash, a vehicle design expert to identify the defect and to provide you with the legal necessity, at least in Alabama, of an alternative design um, then you have to have a, a biomechanical engineer who relates the defect to the injury and who must also um, relate the defect or excuse me, to prevent the defect 
um, with uh, the alternative design. Uh, a life care planner, if it's a serious injury and not a death case, and of course, an economist. Um, let's see. Uh, you're very welcome, Charlie. Hope you're doing well. Uh, anybody else? Um, thank you very much. And again, uh, our marketing department uh, will submit um, your CLE hours for you and a copy of the uh, written materials. Thanks a lot, folks. Y'all take care and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.